you highlighted some of the pain points that we are continuing to face in the world today. So what's the global outlook? Uh, uh, interest rates, uh, it looks like the Fed is pushing out uh, the cut. Uh, at least it was anticipated perhaps March, but it looks now closer to June. Uh, we don't know if it, it will yeah. finally play out that way or not. But uh, what are you reading in terms of uh, global macros? So first of all, we have um, we have five different fixed income teams with five different CIOs, and they all have do they have do, do they have a different take on when the cuts takes. coming? <laughs> so I'm going to give you my take. Um, look, I. I think, and I've been saying for a while, that if we're going to get a hike, it'll be in the second half. It, when we get a hike, it'll be in the second half of, you mean of a cut. this year. Uh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, a cut, cut. <laughs> no. uh, That's like cute. Cut. Yeah, it's going to be in the second half of the year. You know, the consumer is still really strong in the U.S. The Fed came out, or the Atlanta Fed came out with wages saying they're over 5.3%. That's pretty inflationary, nowhere near your... 2% target. There's 1.4 jobs still available for every one person looking for a job. Uh, Michigan sentiment survey came, in, came out saying, you know, people feel incredibly that the, the, the sentiment is, is much more positive. Um, so the consumer, and you see the consumer spending. And as a matter of fact, uh, our Dr. Sonal Desai, who's the CIO of our uh, Franklin fixed income team, just came out with her on my mind talking about productivity. Yeah. We're seeing productivity gains now starting to take off. And so you know, that's all signs of a very robust economy. So I think it's going to be harder for the Fed um, to reach its 2% number. And I think it may be pushed out for those cuts uh, to the second half of the year. I think the market's still a little bit optimistic to think that they're even coming. I mean, we'll see. I think they are being data driven. But June may be too optimistic. Mm. You know, uh, we're now sort of in this high interest rate era, uh, and it looks like it is going to be higher for longer. Uh, what are the implications, not just for large corporations, which at this point in time don't really have a debt problem? The sovereigns have a debt problem. Yeah. Companies don't necessarily have a, uh, a large debt problem at this point in time. But what do you see as the implications for growth, for profitability in this high interest rate era? So I first have to say that you're a lot younger than me <laughs> because the reality is, these rates are more like normal rates if you look in history, right? So it's uh, real rates are probably a little high, but you know it's not. Yeah, it's not totally out of uh, out of the historical norms. It's just the last probably twenty years. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I think the the good news is most companies knew that this was uh, that that this the rate hikes were coming. Uh, and so they actually position themselves very well with longer term debt at, at low. And so if you actually look at it, most companies in the S&P 500 right now, between what they're earning on cash, which is much higher, and what they're paying on their debt lower, is that the cash flow, they're actually cash flow positive. positive. Now, the question is, what happens when it all gets has to get reset? And that's going to see, you're going to start to see a challenge. Um, but there aren't a lot of companies in the next two years that have to reprice their debt. And so I think we're probably fine for a while. And you hope that growth in an economy continues to grow their business out of worrying about when they have to reset and borrow again. Mm. You know, speaking about the reset, and you talked about productivity gains, and I think, uh, you know, through the, the start of 2024 and through the end of 2023, the focus has been on AI. It's almost as if it's this sort of magical silver bullet that's going to solve all of our problems. But I know you ran tech. Uh, yep. uh, so, so what's the take on AI and what, it could mean for organizations like yours in the near term. So the interesting thing I say, you know, AI, why are we suddenly all talking about AI? Because ChatGPT came out just like the internet browser and suddenly we all had AI at our fingertips and we started to understand what it could do and the possibilities. I mean, but the reality is machine learning and other has forms- Has been of, around. Has been around, yeah. people have been using it, particularly anybody who was doing kind of quant portfolio management or any kind of overlay. Um, but I think what's exciting is generative AI that basically is the chat GPT version, uh, which is more language oriented, you know, for somebody like Franklin Templeton, we're, we're, we're active managers. It's about our managers being able to consume more information in a way where they're not trying to chase down each little individual report and, you know, it can come together uh, and just make efficiencies around time. Uh, the ability for salespeople to really gather more information to understand a client when they're going to go into the client and have a much more effective meeting. Like those are the immediate things that I think we're going to see. Um, 
you know, there's things where people are applying AI to, to earnings calls to mm. say what words were being used and these predict this and that. I think we're going to see all those things. But what happens anytime new technology gets in the hands where it starts to get go broad, the first things that, that happens is people just make whatever they do today more efficient. Mm. And we're in that stage with AI, which is we're just creating efficiencies. We rolled out uh, a chat bot on our internal help desk for you know the, the, the technology, desktop technology, and it's answering 60% and, and clearing 60% of the queries. Well, that's great. That's a cost savings and an efficiency. Um, it takes time for the real innovation, I think, to ultimately happen at AI. And we are very much in the early stages of it. Yeah, I would imagine so. But, uh, you know, Jenny, uh, what are the key risks that you're going to be watching out for from here on? Of course, what happens as far as interest rates, et cetera, are concerned, I, I guess to some extent is already uh, factored in. But outside of, outside of the geopolitical risks, what are the other key risks that you're watching out for? Well, I think the geopolitical risks are big. I mean, you know, you, you uh, an expansion of the war in the Middle East could have impact. Um, U.S.-China, you know, we, we, uh, we own a joint venture in China and we're working on trying to, you know, buy it out and... Uh, you, you always worry about whatever policies can end up, you know, throwing you in from the course that you're on. Um, I think cyber security is always, every CEO has got to have cyber security in their top three uh, as far as risks that they worry about. Um, but honestly, I'm incredibly optimistic because in the end, we're active managers. We make active risk decisions, investment decisions. And that's still necessary. And now we can deliver it we can leverage tools like AI to be able to be better in our decision making, and we can customize solutions for our clients that are that aren't just a, a mutual fund, but something that you know is a mutual fund that is directly on a glide path to a client's specific need with for retirement or whatever their goals are. And I think that the tech tools that are coming out are really interesting to be able to deliver much more customized solutions. You said that you're optimistic, but is the mood more risk on or risk off at this point in time? You know, I think everybody's waiting for, first of all, everybody was waiting for, oh my goodness, it's going to be a hard landing or a soft landing. I think most people feel like uh, we are at a soft landing. Um, you know, look at U.S. debt is a concern. I do worry about the amount of U.S. debt. Like I, I, I think the, it's not a risk to the dollar being the reserve currency, but um, it starts to crowd out other investments. Mm -hmm. And it also, uh, you know, U.S., the debt went from, I think it was in 2007, it was yeah. $9 trillion to now it's $33 trillion and we're probably adding $2 trillion a year. Yeah. You have to have buyers of that debt. And, uh, you, you know, at some point you have to attract enough demand to that debt. And that could mean that interest rates end up staying higher. Um, so I think things like that are, are concern. Um, but, you know, again, you've got a, particularly in Asia, where you have a growing population, I mean, India as I mentioned, the population, that's a great tailwind for any economy. Um, and those are all new customers for us. And the pie gets bigger, and that just helps us. Uh, you know, you've, you've of course, been on m and drive. Uh, inorganic growth has been yeah. driving growth for you at Franklin Templeton. Is that going to continue to be something that you focus on and drive harder? Well, we'll always, uh, we'll always look at it. But our, it falls very clearly into three categories. It's either we're filling out product gaps, and a big product gap was... Um, was the uh, private markets. And so we feel today we're 260 billion in private market assets. We're a top 10 alternatives manager. So mm -hmm. we feel really good about where we are with that. The second area were, are tools that help us build deeper relationships mm -hmm. with our partners. And so, you know, if you're a financial advisor, it's no longer that the client's satisfied with just getting investment advice. They really want full financial planning. They may want education of their heirs. They may want you to educate them on you know, financial literacy. And so like we have the Franklin Templeton Academy. Uh, so we've invested in tools that help to, to help our partner financial advisors build deeper relationships with their clients. And then the final category is, you know, we have shareholders in 160 mm. countries. Uh, People tend to invest 80% in their local market before they go outside. And so we've always been a buyer of local asset management. As a matter of fact, we set up organically in 1995, but we acquired a company, Pioneer, uh, a few years later uh, in India. And so getting that kind of capability, and we've sort of done that throughout the world. And so are you, op are you open to M&A here? So <laughs> it's funny, my... 
my head of the country just asked me that question. <laughs> um, what did you have we're, to we're, say? We're <laughs> always, we are always looking, but we're actually really happy with the, the investment folks that we have. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're probably going to stay focused on what we can do. And if there's any m and it would probably be more on distribution and those kind of fintech tools or, or things that help us build broader and deeper relationships with distributors. So let me end then by asking you, Jenny, the outlook for the markets and more importantly, the outlook in 2024 as far as the alternative market is concerned. Um, I think the, the uh, well, the outlook on the markets, I, you know, I, I look at the U.S. and one of the things that concerns me in the market is that you have this huge con concentration of Magnificent Seven. Yes. Um, top 10 stocks in the U.S. market uh, account for about 30% of the market cap of the S&P 500. At the peak of the dot-com, the top 10 was about 26%. So we're more concentrated. Now, there's other ways you can slice that data that you'd say, well, it's maybe not quite as bad as then. But, I mean, that is a real concern. And... Um, I think there's some really great companies there. I'm tending to prefer going a little bit more conservative, making sure that you've got companies with good cash flow. I love getting paid a dividend. Um, but, you know, where's the growth been last year? 71% of the S&P 500 return came from seven stocks. So, you know, they, they clearly um, have, have done well and they're great companies. But that kind of concentration makes me a little bit nervous. Um, but I still think, as I mentioned earlier, that the consumer is pretty strong. Mm. Uh, and um, with that, you'll have the market stay pretty strong. So I think the markets will probably be OK. Even people worry about, is India overvalued? Again, you just continue this growth story, and you're not overvalued if that's the case. Yeah, and, and the markets have been have been moving higher and higher yeah. every time somebody talks about the fact that valuations are far ahead. And yeah. you asked about the alternatives. Look, at I still think those secular trends in the alternative markets makes the demand in both private equity, private credit uh, still very real. Um, but I think that it is not going to be as easy a story as it's been over the last decade, just because interest rates are higher. Well, Jenny, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us here Thank on CBC TV 18 on the Global Dialogue. We wish you the very best of luck uh, with your trip here in India and look forward to seeing you back here again. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's really been fun. Well, with that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of the Global Dialogue. From all of us here on the program, many thanks for watching. A quick break. There's a lot more coming up.